Hello and welcome back to Zoology 141. Today's lecture is on muscle tissue and muscle physiology. So if you remember, we did talk about muscle tissue a couple chapters back when we talked about connective tissues and epithelial tissues and other types of tissues. And so if you remember, there are three different types of muscle tissue, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. And so we're going to talk briefly about the properties of all three of these, and then we're going to spend the rest of the time today talking mainly about skeletal muscle. So if you remember back, we said that skeletal muscle was a striated muscle, that it had little lines going through there, and it was multinucleated, meaning it had several nuclei, and that it was usually under voluntary control, meaning we had to consciously tell ourselves or tell our skeletal muscles to contract. The other types of muscles are involuntary, and that includes cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, we can't control these voluntarily. They're run either by our autonomic nervous system or, in the case of cardiac muscle, it actually contracts using its own rhythm. And so cardiac muscle are relatively short cells. They are single or binucleate. Uh, they are striated, just like skeletal muscle, but again, not under voluntary nervous control. And finally, smooth muscle, we find lining blood vessels, we find uh, in hollow organs like the intestines, the stomach, and smooth muscle, as the name implies, uh, doesn't have any striations. It also is very small cells uh, with a single nucleus and uh, involuntary. We cannot tell our stomach muscle or our blood vessels to constrict. That's run by our endocrine system and our autonomic nervous system. So functions of skeletal muscle include producing body movements. For example, when your biceps brachii muscle contracts, what happens? Your elbow will flex, and so that will reduce the angle between your radius and ulna and your humerus. Another function of muscle tissue is, of course, to stabilize joints and stabilize body positions, so to hold posture, hold you upright and it's also responsible for regulating the volumes of hollow organs. And here we're talking about smooth muscle. So both the bladder and the large and small intestines have this layer of smooth muscle around it that helps to repel substances through these organs, and that's all directed by smooth muscle. The other thing that muscle tissue does is produce heat. Obviously, if you're cold, uh, one of the mechanisms we have for restoring homeostasis is to initiate a little bit of contraction of skeletal muscle, and that contraction will generate heat, and that heat will bring us back into our thermostasis set point. So all of these are functions of muscle tissue. Now muscle tissue, particularly skeletal muscle tissue, also has some unique properties, and these include things like excitability. Uh, muscle tissue is excitable. If we expose it to, let's say, a neurotransmitter like acetylcholine, it will do something. It will forcefully contract. And so it is excitable. And so by excitable, we mean that it's responsive to outside stimulus, specifically chemical stimulus in the form of neurotransmitters. The other thing that muscle tissue can do is it can conduct electrical activity. So we already said before that neurons are cells that transmit information through electrical impulses. But it's also important to realize that muscle cells can conduct an electrical impulse. So in a couple of slides from now, we're going to talk about the way in which motor neurons signal skeletal muscle cells to contract. And it basically involves a nerve impulse and secretion of neurotransmitter from that nerve cell to the muscle cell. And so this muscle cell will become excited in response to this neurotransmitter. It will generate an action potential or nerve impulse and will also conduct that nerve impulse along the axis of that muscle cell. And of course, number three, this is one that you already know. Skeletal muscle fibers are contractile. That is, they can forcefully shorten and we can use that forceful shortening to do work. The other thing about muscle tissue is that it's extensible. That is, it can stretch out. Once we contract it, it can go back to its original shape. It's extensible, although it's not forcefully extensible. So think about flexion of your forearm. That involves contraction of your biceps muscle, which causes that flexion. But to forcefully extend it, that is, go back the other way, we have another muscle that does that, and that's the triceps muscle. And so muscles, again, can only forcefully contract. They cannot forcefully extend. And finally, the last property of muscle is that it has to be elastic. We have to be able to stretch it, we have to be able to contract it, and then it has to be elastic. It has to be able to snap back to its original shape without injury. So all five of these are properties of muscle tissue. Now it's important to realize that just like bones, muscles are in fact organs because they contain multiple types of tissue. 
And so muscles contain obviously muscle tissue, and here we're talking about mainly skeletal muscle tissue, but they also contain connective tissue. Examples of connective tissue that we find associated with muscles include fibrous connective tissue, for example, that we find in tendons, and also surrounding the muscle we find epimysium and perimysium, all of which are made of fibrous connective tissue. And of course, if you look at the picture at right, you can see that muscle tissue, like the steak this guy is sort of gnawing on, also contains some adipose tissue. So adipose tissue is yet another type of connective tissue found with muscle. And of course, there's also blood in there. Um, most muscles require a pretty good blood supply. So we're going to have both blood vessels and also blood. So that consists of both connective tissue and epithelial tissue. And of course, remember that skeletal muscle will only contract when signaled to do so by neurons. So we have a lot of nervous tissue associated with muscle as well. So big picture here is that muscles are in fact organs, and we have a lot of them. Okay, here's a brief overview of skeletal muscle macroanatomy. Remember that macro means big, and so here we're looking at very large macroscopic structures. So here we can see a muscle that's been bisected. Let's say maybe it's the biceps brachii muscle that's attached to the humerus. And of course the muscle is the organ itself. And if we look at that muscle, we see that it's divided into units called fascicles. A fascicle is a bundle of muscle cells that are surrounded by connective tissue. And you've probably seen these fascicles if you've eaten something like corned beef or pastrami, and you look at the meat and you see that you have bundles of cells surrounded by connective tissues, and those bundles are called fascicles. Now within a fascicle, we find our individual muscle cells, and another name that we use for muscle cells is muscle fibers. And the reason we call them muscle fibers is that, remember, skeletal muscle cells can be very, very long and fibrous, and so we call them muscle fibers instead of muscle cells. And finally, if we zoom in on that muscle cell, we can see that it in fact contains other units within it called myofibrils. So myofibrils are specialized organelles found within skeletal muscle, and their job, of course, is to contract. So each muscle fiber or cell will contain lots and lots of these long myofibrils. So this slide just shows an overview of the different types of connective tissue that cover muscle and also are found within the muscle themselves. Remember we already said that tendons were ropey connections made of fibrous connective tissue and their job was to connect muscle to bone. And so here you can see an example of a tendon. Now continuous with that tendon is another sheet of fibrous connective tissue called the epimysium. Epi means on top and myo means muscle. And so this is connective tissue that covers the entire muscle. And it gives it a little bit of structure and it acts sort of like a skeleton on the outside of the muscle. It prevents it from expanding too much and the cells from rupturing. Now within the muscle, we see that the fascicles are divided from one another by another sheet of connective tissue called the perimysium. So perimysium surrounds the fascicles, and remember that a fascicle was in fact a bundle of muscle cells, and each fascicle is separated from every other fascicle by this connective tissue bundle. And finally, if we look within that fascicle and pull out an individual cell, we see that that cell is in fact covered with another connective tissue, and here we refer to that as endomysium. So endomysium covers the cell, perimysium covers the fascicle, and epimysium covers the entire muscle. And the whole purpose of these connective tissues is to give a little bit of structure to the muscle and a little bit of support. And so it's like a fibrous connective tissue skeleton found within the muscle. So now we're going to go back and take a closer look at the components of a skeletal muscle fiber, which was the same thing as a skeletal muscle cell. So the first thing you notice is that the majority of the inside diameter is filled with these myofibrils. Remember that myofibrils were the contractile organelles that we find within a skeletal muscle cell. You can see that each one of these myofibrils is divided up into repeating units called sarcomeres. And sarcomeres are important because they are the smallest contractile unit of a skeletal muscle. So the thing that makes the myofibrils contract is contraction of the sarcomeres. And when the sarcomeres contract, the myofibrils contract, and eventually the whole muscle cell and the whole muscle will contract. Other things we find in the cell, of course, is the nucleus, which you can see uh, is squeezed towards the outside or periphery of the cell. Remember, the nucleus contains the DNA. And then we see something that is the mitochondrion. And of course, muscles have to have a fair number of mitochondria. And that's because they use a lot of energy.
Remember the purpose of the mitochondrion was to extract ATP out of our food molecules, for example to break down fats or carbohydrates and convert that into a form of energy that the muscles can use, which is ATP. Now another organelle that we have in there is something called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is most similar to the smooth ER or smooth endoplasmic reticulum. But here the function of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is to store calcium because calcium is the key to muscle contraction. When calcium is released by the sarcoplasmic reticulum, those myofibrils will contract. And so when the muscle's not contracting, the sarcoplasmic reticulum will store all that calcium up and sequester it away from the myofibrils. Another structure that I'd like you to take a look at is something called the T-tubule. And the T-tubule is just a porthole or passageway from the cell surface called the sarcolemma deep down into the cell interior where the myofibrils are. And this T-tubule is very important because its job is to transmit the electrical charge from the outside of the cell deep into the cell so that we can signal the muscles to contract. You can see a little bit closer up picture of the sarcomere. Remember that the sarcomeres were the repeating units of the myofibril and they are in fact the smallest contractile unit of a muscle. And so each sarcomere extends from something called one Z-line to the next Z-line. And the Z-lines are the structures highlighted here. Now within the sarcomere we find two main types of protein, actin and myosin. Myosin is the thick red protein that you see here with a little golf club like heads on it. And actin is the thin orange proteins that you see that are attached to the sides of the Z-lines. So this slide just contains some important vocabulary that has to do with muscles and muscle physiology. We've already talked about most of these terms, but we'll go through them again. Remember the sarcolemma was the cell membrane of a muscle cell, whereas the nuclei, of course, is like the nucleus of any cell that it contains genetic information. But remember, skeletal muscle cells contain lots of nuclei. They also contain lots of mitochondria because most skeletal muscle cells are using a lot of energy and therefore need to generate a fair amount of ATP. The job of the T-tubules was to carry electrical charges from the surface of the cell deep into the cell so it can signal for that muscle cell to contract. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum was a specialized organelle, stores calcium, and releases that calcium when contraction is needed. Now another term that we haven't gone through yet is something called myoglobin. Remember that the combining form myo means muscle, and globin, where have you heard of that before? Well, if you're thinking of blood, you're right, because myoglobin and hemoglobin are very similar. Now, hemoglobin is that red pigment that we find in red blood cells, and its job is to carry and bind to oxygen. Myoglobin is another red pigment that we find in muscle tissue, and its job is the same, to bind to and carry oxygen, because some muscles use a lot of oxygen during aerobic exercise, so we have to have a lot of myoglobin. And myoglobin is the reason that red meat is red. It's red because of the pigment in the myoglobin. And finally, the myofibrils we've already talked about. But again, they're the contractile units or contractile organelles within an individual muscle cell. And the myofibrils are divided into sarcomeres, which we said was smallest contractile unit of a muscle cell. And that's an important term that may show up on an exam. And remember that the sarcomeres were composed of myosin and actin. These are the contractile proteins. Now we already said that the sarcomeres are composed of two main proteins that have to do with the contraction. The first of these is myosin, which is the thick protein with the golf club head type appendages on there. And myosin tends to stay in the center of the sarcomere, whereas actin, the second protein, is located on the sides of the sarcomere. Now, if you take a look at the actin molecule, you can see that there we have this spiral series of beads and that each bead has a little bitty opening on it. Now, these openings are important because this is where the little golf club heads from myosin are going to bind and form something called a cross bridge. A cross bridge is just a connection between actin and myosin. Normally, when we're not contracting, a cross bridge is not possible because those little holes on the actin molecule are covered up by a complex protein called troponin and tropomyosin. And together, troponin and tropomyosin basically act as a guard to prevent the golf club heads of myosin from joining and forming a connection bridge with actin but the troponin tropomyosin will adjust its configuration depending on whether or not calcium is present. 
So if no calcium is present, the binding sites on the actin molecule are blocked by the troponin and tropomyosin molecules. However, when the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium, that calcium will bind to the troponin and tropomyosin and that will cause a shift in these molecules, moving them out of the way and exposing the myosin binding sites on the actin molecule. Now once that happens, myosin's greedy little golf club heads will insert themselves into the receptacles on the actin molecule and that's when we form something called a cross bridge. So we need calcium in order to have cross bridge formation. So we said that once calcium is present, myosin and actin can connect with one another forming something called the cross bridge. And so here we're looking at something called the sliding filament mechanism of contraction. This describes how muscle cells contract. So here we're at the level of the sarcomere, and remember a sarcomere extends from one Z-disc to the next Z-disc, and those are just Z-shaped proteins that make up the side of the sarcomere. Interior from the Z-discs we have, of course, are actin molecules. The actin molecules are the thin filaments, and they're attached to the sides of the Z-disc. Now let's take a look at the inside. The very inside or middle, which is called the H-zone, contains our myosin and myosin has those little golf club heads that are grabbing on to actin, so they're forming cross bridges. Now, once those cross bridges are formed, myosin will begin to pull the actin molecules towards it. So myosin stays put, but it pulls the actin molecules towards itself, and as a result, the edges of the sarcomere get closer together. And so this is how muscle contraction works on a very small level. So now we're going to take a close-up look at the four or five steps involved in cross bridge formation and muscle contraction. Again, here we're looking at the level of the sarcomere at the interaction between the thick protein, myosin, and the thin protein, actin. And so we're going to start at the end of a previous contraction. And at the end of the contraction, myosin and actin are still connected until an ATP molecule binds to the head of the myosin molecule. Once that happens, the myosin head is then able to let go of the actin. So that's step number one. Now once that happens, the myosin head will then break down the ATP into ADP. Remember ATP stood for adenosine triphosphate, and that was a high energy molecule, whereas ADP is adenosine diphosphate, a low energy molecule. And here, the myosin head has used that energy to cock itself back. And I like to think of this as being sort of like cocking back the hammer on a gun, but it's also sort of like uh, a paddle. Imagine if you're somebody that paddles a lot, you know that you have a power stroke, and before you can have another stroke, you have to elevate your paddle and put it in front of you before you can contract. And so this is exactly what's going on with a myosin head. It used the energy from ATP to cock the myosin head back in anticipation of grabbing a hold of that actin molecule once again. So once that myosin head has been cocked back using the energy from ATP, it will then form a cross bridge. And again, this assumes that calcium is present because remember, we need calcium in order to move the troponin and tropomyosin molecules out of the way of the myosin binding sites on actin. So if calcium is present, the binding sites are exposed, and that myosin head will join with the actin receptacle, forming a cross bridge. So once the cross bridge is formed, the myosin head will release the ADP and free phosphate, and then do something called the power stroke. It will basically pull on the actin molecule, pulling it closer towards itself, in order to pull the sides of the sarcomere closer to it. And so this slide just shows a summary of the four steps of muscle contraction. One, we use ATP to cock back the myosin head. Two, we form the cross bridge, that is the connection between actin and myosin. Number three, we have the power stroke. Myosin actively pulls on the actin molecule, pulling it closer towards itself. And finally, we have cross bridge detachment. Remember, in order to detach from the actin molecule, we have to have a fresh ATP molecule binding to the myosin head. If we run out of ATP, myosin cannot let go of actin, and that's a problem. There are certain circumstances in the body where we temporarily run out of ATP, and as a result, the muscles stay contracted. And so some types of muscle fatigue and muscle spasms can be due to a temporary lack of ATP.
The other thing that can happen is that when people die or other mammals die is that the sarcoplasmic reticulum becomes leaky, all the calcium leaks out, which starts all this muscle contraction. Now because that individual is dead, all the muscle contraction quickly uses up all the ATP in the cell. However, once the ATP is used up, those contracting muscles cannot relax. And so that causes something we call rigor mortis. Rigor mortis is this temporary stiffening of the muscles that happens soon after death, and it's a result of the leaky calcium getting out of the SR, causing the contraction, but then using up all the ATP. So now that we know how cross bridge formation happens, we're going to take a step back and talk about the electrical and chemical events necessary for this to occur. And this process happens in seven steps, which are detailed here on this slide. Now in the preceding slides, I'm going to go through this process step by step. The fact that I'm going through this step by step should tell you that I think it's very, very important that you understand this process. And what I mean by that is this process would be an excellent candidate for one of those diagram and describe questions that I've listed previously on the exams. So be sure you can both draw and diagram the steps necessary for sarcomere contraction. So here you can see a simple diagram of a skeletal muscle cell as well as all the components necessary for contraction. Starting out, we have our skeletal muscle cell, which is bound by the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma, of course, is the cell membrane of the skeletal muscle cell. We can also see within the skeletal muscle cell something called the T-tubule. The T-tubule is a porthole for electrical charges to travel from the sarcolemma deep into the cell. And of course, the blue organelle you see is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember that the job of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is to store and secrete calcium when stimulated. And so those little red dots you see are in fact calcium ions. At the bottom of the screen you can see a simple representation of a sarcomere. The pink lines at the ends of the sarcomere are the Z lines and the orange proteins that you see are a representation of actin, the thin filament that is bound to the ends of the sarcomere. In the middle of the sarcomere, you can see two examples of myosin. Remember, myosin is the thick filament that has the little golf club-like heads on it that bind to the actin molecule. Now, if we take a step back from our muscle cell, we can see the yellow structure up top is a motor neuron. Remember that motor neurons control the contraction of skeletal muscle. So the first step of this process is going to be the arrival of an action potential or nerve impulse at the end of the motor neuron. Remember that an action potential is an electrical charge and here this action potential has been propagated either from the spinal cord or the brain. Once the action potential arrives at the end of the axon or the end bulb, this is going to cause an influx of calcium into the axon bulb. This influx of calcium is going to cause the release of synaptic vesicles containing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine by the axon end bulb. The vesicles containing acetylcholine will then diffuse across the synaptic cleft until they reach the sarcolemma of the muscle cell. Once they reach the sarcolemma, this will cause a sudden influx of sodium ions which will cause a new action potential or impulse along the sarcolemma. This action potential will travel laterally along the sarcolemma until it reaches the T-tubules. It will then take a right turn deep into the T-tubules and proceed to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Once the charge arrives at the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the sarcoplasmic reticulum will release calcium ions, represented here as the little red circles. The calcium ions will diffuse through the sarcoplasm until they reach the sarcomere. Once they enter the sarcomere, they will then bind to the troponin tropomyosin complex, which will then slide out of the way, exposing the myosin binding sites along the actin molecule. This will result in cross bridge formation, where myosin grabs a hold of actin by the myosin binding sites on the actin molecule. Once cross bridge formation occurs, myosin will begin to pull actin towards it, thereby shortening the sides of the sarcomere. So that's just a rather simple and quick explanation of the process of excitation contraction coupling that goes on within a skeletal muscle cell. As I said, I think this process is very important to you being able to understand the physiology of muscle contraction. So do yourself a favor, go ahead and review this animation two or three more times and make sure that you memorize each of the seven steps necessary for sarcomere contraction. So now that we know a little bit about the physiology of muscle fiber contraction, we're going to study how that contraction is used to do useful work. And so in order to do that, we need to understand something called a muscle twitch.
and a muscle twitch is just a complete cycle of contraction and relaxation of an individual muscle or muscle fiber. And so there are three phases to a muscle twitch. Latent period, which is the time between nervous stimulation and the start of muscular contraction, the actual period of contraction in which the muscle fiber is shortening, and then the period of relaxation when the muscle fiber relaxes and goes back to its original length. So for your own notes and edification, this slide just shows the definitions for the different periods that we're going to talk about in the next slide. I'm not going to go over them now because I'm going to go over them when we have a nice large slide that we can talk about the stages of muscle twitch. But do keep these definitions handy in case you forget. Okay, this graph is something called a myogram. A myogram is just a graph of the force of muscle contraction over time. You see that on the x-axis we have the time here in milliseconds. And a millisecond is one one-thousandth of a second. So we're talking about a very small period of time here. On the y-axis, or vertical axis, we have the force of contraction. That is, we're measuring the force generated by the muscle as it starts to shorten and contract. So let's start out at time zero. The arrowhead at time zero indicates the time at which nerve impulse arrives to an individual muscle cell. You notice that for a while there we don't have any contraction and that's because we're in the latent period. The latent period is the period between nervous stimulation and actually when we start to see muscle contraction. And the reason we have a latent period is because there's a lot of stuff that has to go on between nervous stimulation and actual contraction. Remember we have to release neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter has to travel across, bind to the muscle cell, we have to start another electrical charge, go down the T-tubules, release the calcium, all that stuff takes time and that's why there's a slight delay between the arrival of the nerve impulse and the actual contraction of the muscle and that's called the latent period and that lasts about 5 milliseconds for skeletal muscle. Now between millisecond 5 and millisecond 25, you can see a rising contraction. That is, we're having greater and greater force being generated as the sarcomeres in that muscle start to shorten and the muscle starts to contract. And then around 25 milliseconds, the sarcomeres begin to expand again and we begin the relaxation period. So the relaxation period is again about 25 milliseconds. It's relatively short so that the whole time of muscle contraction is only about 45 milliseconds. And this is a very short period of time. We can't do a whole lot of usable work in 45 milliseconds. And so in the next few slides we're going to learn how skeletal muscles adjust their time and also their strength of contraction. Now the last thing I need to talk about before moving on to the next slide is something called the refractory period. Now the refractory period is a period after the initial contraction of a muscle fiber when that muscle will not or is unlikely to contract again. And it's usually a very short period, but it is a period that if we stimulate it twice after that muscle contracts, uh, it may not contract again for a few more milliseconds. And this is because we have to restock all the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We have to refresh our supply of ATP and so on. And so the refractory period is a period when we're not likely to have a second muscle contraction. So the takeaway from the last slide is that a muscle twitch involves three processes. The latent period in which nothing's really going on, or at least no contraction. Then we have a contraction period and a relaxation period. And all of this happens amazingly quick, usually in about 50 milliseconds. And like we said, you really can't get a whole lot done in 50 milliseconds. You can't even put a period at the end of your name. It's not enough time. And so the way to get sustained muscle contraction is through something called wave summation. Basically, if we signal one muscle cell a second time before it completely relaxes, we can get both a longer and also a stronger contraction. And that's through the process of wave summation, which we'll show in just a minute. And so wave summation can result in something called complete tetanus or incomplete tetanus. You've probably heard of tetanus before and you probably think about that disease that you get by stepping on a rusty nail and that it's associated with lockjaw, which is this you know, sustained contraction of muscle of the jaw. And that's true, but that's sort of the disease uh, or at least a sign of a disease. Here we're not talking about a disease but a normal process. So the tetanus we're talking about is not abnormal, it's just a sustained muscle contraction. And that can either be unfused tetanus or fused tetanus. So let's take a look at another myogram like we did in the last slide. On the x-axis we have time in milliseconds and on the y-axis we have the force of contraction. 
Now the blue line down below with the blips in it indicates the time of arrival of a nerve impulse, whereas the red line measures the contractile force of the muscle cell. So let's take a look at the first blip. So here we see we have the arrival of the action potential or nerve impulse. But what's happening to the muscle? Initially, nothing's happening because remember there's a slight delay between the nerve impulse and actual contraction of the sarcomere. And we call this again the latent period. So here we have one blip, a latent period, and then contraction relaxation. Now let's look at what happens if we send a second nerve impulse to that muscle cell before it has a chance to fully relax. So we have the first nerve impulse, a contraction, start to relax, and then whoop, another nerve impulse. What happens now? Well this causes a contraction that's stronger than the first and it also makes the overall contraction time longer as well. Now let's see what happens with four nerve impulses. Here we see something called unfused tetanus. Each nerve impulse results in an additional strength of magnitude or an additional strength of contraction until on the fourth contraction we're much greater than the initial or first contraction and we never fully relaxed uh, between these four contractions. So this is an example of something called unfused tetanus and would result in a progressively stronger and stronger muscle contraction. And finally, the slide at right, you can see what happens if we signal that muscle to uh, contract with multiple nerve impulses in a very short period of time. So eventually we have something called fused tetanus or complete wave summation. The series of very frequent nerve impulses results in this maximal contraction and a sustained contraction as well. So here we get a nice smooth contraction that lasts for a longer period of time. So the takeaway message of the last two slides is that in order to get a muscle to contract stronger and longer, we don't send a more powerful nerve impulse, we just send more nerve impulses and we send them closer together. That is, we send nerve impulses that are at a higher frequency. And so if we stimulate an individual muscle cell 20 to 30 times a second, we'll get only partial relaxation between each stimuli, resulting in the unfused tetanus shown in the center. However, if we stimulate the same muscle cell more frequently, that is 80 to 100 times per second, we get a sustained muscle contraction called fused tetanus. And so the greater frequency of stimulation of a muscle cell results in a stronger and longer contraction. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about something called the motor unit. Now I want you to think of picking up a pencil or a pen and at the same time flexing your forearm. When you flex your forearm or elbow, what muscles involve there? Well, that's going to be your biceps brachii muscle, your biceps. And so if you're picking up a pencil or let's say a pair of sunglasses, are you really using all the muscle fibers that are in your biceps muscle? Well, probably not. Your muscles have something called motor units. And a motor unit is just an individual motor neuron in all the skeletal muscle fibers it controls. And so each muscle is made up of hundreds if not thousands of motor units. And so some of these motor units consist of one nervous cell controlling 10 or 20 muscle cells, whereas other motor units consist of one neuron controlling 2,000 or 3,000 cells. And so some of the motor units contain more cells than the other. And so if we're picking up something very small, we tend to only use a few of the motor units, whereas if we're picking up something very large and heavy, we're using more and more of the motor units. So the total strength of a muscular contraction really depends on how many motor units we are calling up, and that process is called recruitment. It also depends on how large the muscle fibers are within each of these motor units. So this slide just shows an example of what these motor units might look like. Here we see an axon of an individual motor neuron and then all of a sudden that axon will branch and have several different extensions that go to several different muscle fibers. And the place where one of these extensions meets with a muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction. And at each of these neuromuscular junctions this neuron will release the neurotransmitter which results in the electrical charge and eventually the contraction of the skeletal muscle fibers. And so if we have a very large motor unit, that is where one cell controls two or three thousand muscle cells, we'll have individual connections between each of those muscle cells and that single neuron. So let's look at a simple example. Here we have pictured is a motor neuron and the red circles you see down there are individual muscle cells. So this motor unit consists of one motor neuron which is connected to three muscle cells. When that motor neuron forms an action potential or nerve impulse, 
the nerve impulse will travel down the axon and travel to all three of the muscle cells, eventually causing contraction of all three simultaneously. Now, because this neuron is only controlling three muscle cells, it's really not going to result in a very strong contraction. So chances are, unless you're doing something like sewing or something that does involve a lot of strength, you're going to use more motor units. Now let's take a look at a second motor unit. This is the green cell in the middle of the screen. So this one controls four muscle cells. And just like the cell at the left, when that neuron forms an action potential, all four of the cells will contract simultaneously. Because there are four cells instead of three, this motor unit will result in a little bit stronger contraction. But remember, your body can decide how many motor units it's going to activate. If you only need a little bit of contraction, maybe we'll just use the guy on the left, that is the yellow motor unit. Whereas if we need a little bit stronger contraction, your brain may activate both the yellow motor unit and the green motor unit simultaneously to result in a larger contraction. Now let's take a look at the blue motor unit. This motor unit is much larger, that is it controls many more cells than either the green or yellow motor unit. And you can also notice that some of those cells are larger in the diameter than either those of the green or yellow motor units. And so when the blue neuron fires off a nerve impulse or action potential, that is obviously going to cause all of its cells to contract. And because it has more cells and larger cells, that's going to be a much bigger contraction than either the blue or the green motor units. And so this illustrates a very important point when it comes to motor units, and that is that size does matter. And by size, I mean both the number of muscle cells a individual neuron controls, as well as the size of those muscle cells. So if we look back at the yellow cell, it controlled just a very few very small cells. This would be a very good motor unit for controlling very fine muscle contraction. We can in fact use the yellow and the green motor unit together to coordinate some very fine motor movement. On the other hand, if we need a maximal contraction or a really strong contraction, there we're going to activate not just the yellow and the green motor unit, but also activate the blue motor unit because it contains the greatest number of fibers as well as the greatest diameter of fibers. And the larger diameter of a muscle fiber, the stronger the contraction. Unfortunately, large motor units also give us very coarse control of muscle movement. And so once you're activating the largest, most numerous muscle units, you're often getting some very jerky or coarse muscle contraction. For example, think about the last time you went to the gym and did some serious bench presses. Now, for me, this was several years ago, but I still remember trying to lift, let's say, 200 pounds, which for me was a lot back then, and it took everything that I had to be able to lift that bar uh, off my neck and put it back onto the weight bench. And as I was pushing that bar upwards, my muscles were really, really jerky. And the reason they're jerky is that motor units are turning on and off all throughout the muscle contraction. And when one turns on or off, we notice this surge or sudden decrease in muscle contraction force. And so that's why we get this very jerky movement, because we're activating very large motor units, which don't have a very nuanced control of the muscle fibers, and that's why we get the jerky movement. This slide is just a review of the concepts we covered this far regarding the strength and length of muscle contraction. The strength of muscle contraction can be determined by at least four different factors. First of these is the number of motor units recruited or stimulated. Remember, recruitment is a process by which your brain selects individual neurons which control groups of muscle fibers. If we just need a very small contraction, let's say to pick up a pencil, your brain will activate only a very few motor units, and these motor units will probably only control a small number of cells. Now, on the other hand, if it needs a larger contraction, we're going to recruit more and more motor units, that is, more motor neurons that are in charge of more skeletal muscle fibers. Another thing that affects the force of contraction is the size of the fibers. Larger fibers are stronger than smaller fibers, but they also have less control. So initially, we recruit the motor units that control small fibers, and then eventually, if we need more contraction, we will activate the motor units that control a large number of large diameter fibers. The other thing that affects the strength of contraction is the frequency of stimulation. Remember that wave summation was that process where repeated nervous stimulation of a muscle fiber gave us a stronger and longer contraction. And so the closer together those nerve impulses are, the stronger the contraction will be. And finally, the last thing that affects muscle strength is the degree of muscle stretch. That is, there's an optimal degree of muscle stretch to get the strongest contraction possible. 
And so to illustrate this, think about the guys that do the deadlifts uh, where they're lifting a very heavy weight and curling it. Now initially, if they're picking up a very heavy weight, they'll stand up, pick that weight up, and then they're going to throw their back backwards just a little bit in order to get a little bit more angle on their elbow. If that elbow is at 180 degrees with the lower arm, it's very hard to get a maximal contraction. But if we just reduce that angle just a little bit, let's say to, I don't know, 120 degrees, then our muscles are going to be an optimal degree of muscle stretch in order to be able to flex and curl that tremendous weight. And so the degree of muscle stretch is also important in determining how forcefully a muscle can contract. Okay, now we're going to shift gears a little bit and finish up the lecture by talking a little bit about muscle tone, muscle metabolism, and endurance. So first on to muscle tone. Now muscle tone is the involuntary contraction of muscles within the skeletal system. I know before that we said that skeletal muscle fibers were voluntarily controlled, and that's true, but we also have some involuntary control. That is, even though you're not thinking about it or ordering contraction to these muscle fibers, there's a little bit of contraction and relaxation going on all the time, and that's because your autonomic nervous system in your brain is sending periodic nerve impulses to all your skeletal muscle fibers to give them a little bit of tone and to keep them in shape. And so by giving them this periodic stimulation, the muscle fibers are kept in shape and toned. If we were to sever this connection between the nervous tissue and the muscle tissue, then these fibers would never contract again. And if they don't have nervous innervation, they will waste away very, very quickly. We call that process atrophy. And one way we can use the concept of muscle tone as a diagnostic tool is to observe the muscle tone in the face of your patients. If you have a patient come in and you notice a facial slouch, let's say on one side of the face, let's say it's the right side of the face, we know that something has happened to affect the nervous system. In most cases, it's going to be the left side of the brain that has been affected, resulting in temporary paralysis or slouching of the muscles on the right side of the face. Muscle tone is also important within smooth muscle because it helps to ensure the correct diameter of blood vessel walls. If blood vessels all of a sudden dilate completely, their lumen size increases, making them much larger than normal. And this has a very drastic effect on blood pressure. It causes blood pressure to go from being you know, in the optimal range to dropping very, very quickly. And so it's also necessary to have a certain degree of muscle tone within our smooth muscle of our blood vessels. Now we're going to go on to talk about different types of muscle contraction. And these can be divided into two groups, isometric and isotonic. Iso here meaning same and metric meaning length. So an isometric contraction is a contraction where the muscle is forming cross bridges, but it's not actually changing in length. For example, if I were to give you a 30 pound dumbbell, and I would just say, hold this in your hand, but don't flex it, don't move it. Even though you're not moving this weight, you're still generating force with your muscles to oppose the force of gravity. And so even though the weight's not moving, cross bridges are still forming within your muscle. And so we call this an isometric contraction. On the other hand, an isotonic contraction is one where the muscle contracts and changes in length. And this can be divided into either a concentric or an eccentric contraction. So the concentric contraction is the one you see in the middle of the screen. Here our biceps brachii muscle is contracting and the force of this contraction is greater than the force of the weight in my hand. As a result, the elbow flexes and the dumbbell moves closer to me. On the other hand, an eccentric contraction is one where we're still forming cross bridges, our muscle is still contracting, but the force of that contraction is not as great as the force of the weight that we're holding. And so if I'm extending my elbow and moving that dumbbell away from me in a controlled manner, this is an example of an eccentric movement. Okay, now we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about muscle metabolism. Metabolism, remember, is the process that muscles and other cells of the body use to extract energy from food molecules in order to power the various body processes. Now, muscles tend to be very metabolically expensive, so they often have a lot of mitochondria to convert the food molecules in our blood into things like ATP. So muscles do run on ATP, but they only have a little bit of ATP on hand. On average, each muscle will have somewhere between 4 to 10 seconds of ATP around. Now once that ATP is used up, we have to go on to other sources of energy, such as creatine phosphate, 
anaerobic metabolism, and then aerobic metabolism. So we're going to go through each of these in a little bit of detail. So I want you to imagine that a friend of yours has just challenged you to a 100-yard dash. It's not a very long distance, but chances are it's going to take you mm, half a minute or so to do this. And so initially, we're going to use ATP to fuel the muscle contraction that helps us run the 100-yard dash. However, within three to five seconds, that ATP is gone, and so we now need to recharge it. And one way we can recharge our ATP is using a molecule called creatine phosphate. So creatine phosphate is three to six times more plentiful than ATP within the muscle. And what it can do is it can help us phosphorylate ADP, which was the discharged form, into ATP, which is the recharged form. And we have enough creatine phosphate in the muscles to sustain about 15 seconds of contraction. However, once the creatine phosphate is used up, then we have to go to another energy source. Now before I move on to the next slide, I should point out that a lot of athletes now are trying creatine supplementation. We can find a lot of supplements on the market that contain a creatine or creatine phosphate derivative. And the claim of these supplements is that they help uh, weightlifters work out for longer periods of time because they're able to recharge their ATP molecules more frequently. And the greater length of the workout should obviously result in greater muscle mass and so on. However, there are certain safety concerns with these and other supplements on the market. Remember that supplements are not the same things as drugs. Drugs are evaluated by the FDA for both safety and efficacy, that is, how do they work where supplements generally are not unless a problem is noted. And so if you've been reading the newspaper lately, you've probably read about a weight loss supplement sold nationwide, including here in Hawaii, that has resulted in liver damage and liver failure and even a couple of fatalities. And so oftentimes these supplements are not tested on lab animals or people, and we don't know there's a problem until people start taking them and they start dying. And so you have to be sort of leery about supplements and make sure you do your homework and research them very well before you consider taking them. Okay, so in the last slide we said that we had approximately 10 seconds of ATP on hand, and once that ATP had been used up, we could recharge it using our creatine phosphate molecule. However, we only have a few seconds of creatine phosphate around as well. So if we're going to do any type of sustained muscular contraction, eventually we're going to have to switch to something called anaerobic cellular respiration. So here, ATP is produced from the breakdown of glucose into pyruvic acid in a process called glycolysis. Remember, glyco just means sugar, and lysis here means to break down. So if we're breaking down glucose without the benefit of oxygen, we're going to produce something called pyruvic acid, but we're also going to produce 2-ATP. Now, 2-ATP is good because that's two more ATP than we had in the first place, but we have to look at the other byproduct, pyruvic acid. Once created, pyruvic acid is quickly converted into lactic acid, which enters the bloodstream. Now, lactic acid you've probably heard of before, because lactic acid causes the burning sensation in your muscles after a heavy workout. For example, this is the burn that you feel after three sets of reps uh, doing very heavy weights on a bench press or something like that. And a lot of athletes like the burn because it indicates that they're really working out their muscles as much as possible, but the burn also prevents us from having any kind of sustained muscle contraction. Now you might ask yourself, why do we do anaerobic metabolism when we're weightlifting? Well, one reason is because oftentimes we're not lifting that weight for a very long period of time. It's a short period of time we can get by with anaerobic metabolism. The other thing that happens is that when muscles are really, really contracting, they tend to squeeze off the blood flow going through them and prevent oxygenated blood from reaching all the muscles. So in this case, we're going to have to extract any ATP uh, out of our glucose by using anaerobic metabolism. And so if we're doing any type of muscle contraction that's going longer than 30 seconds or say a minute or so, we need to start some type of aerobic cellular respiration. Anaerobic here means with the benefit of oxygen. So we need to be able to get oxygen to our muscle cells, and we do that, of course, through the blood in the bloodstream. Now the other thing we need are our mitochondria. Mitochondria use that oxygen to help break down our foods, for example, proteins, fats, and also carbohydrates, and use that energy to generate ATP. But they do need oxygen present in order to do this. Now, in the last slide, we said that through glycolysis, we could get ATP without the benefit of oxygen, but we only got around 2 ATP per glucose.
However, if we use oxygen and we use our mitochondria, we can get somewhere between 36 and 38 ATP per glucose molecule using aerobic respiration. And the other thing is, we don't produce any of that nasty lactic acid. And so as a result, we don't feel that burn that you do with anaerobic respiration, and so you're usually able to work out for even longer. Now it's important to point out that the body doesn't shift immediately from anaerobic respiration to aerobic respiration right at one minute, but it's a gradual process where more and more of the metabolism comes from aerobic respiration than anaerobic respiration. And so in order to get to a point where an exercise physiologist would say, you know, you're really doing a lot of aerobic exercise, we usually need to have sustained exercise for uh, more than 10 or 20 minutes. Once you reach the 10 or 20 minutes, your body is primarily running on aerobic cellular respiration. That is, 90% of your muscle cells are using oxygen to get ATP rather than using anaerobic metabolism. Now, regardless of the type of exercise that you've done, whether aerobic or anaerobic, you probably at some point experience something like muscle fatigue. Now, muscle fatigue is the inability of a muscle to contract after prolonged activity. And factors that contribute to physiological fatigue include things like insufficient release of acetylcholine. We can actually run out of acetylcholine, which was our neurotransmitter. And without the neurotransmitter, our muscle cells won't contract. The other thing that can happen is we can have depletion in the ATP and the creatine phosphate. And without those two molecules, we can't fuel our muscle cells to contract. We can also have a temporary decline in intracellular calcium. And remember, calcium was necessary in order to signal these sarcomeres to contract. And the other thing we can have is insufficient oxygen. Without oxygen, we don't have ATP or insufficient amounts of glycogen. Glycogen is a polysaccharide uh, stored within the muscle cells that can be broken down into glucose and oxidized using both anaerobic and aerobic respiration. And finally, the last thing that can contribute to muscle fatigue is the buildup of lactic acid. Lactic acid causes the burn. It also creates pain in there, which oftentimes makes us unable to go on. Now, there's a difference here between something called physiological fatigue and central fatigue or mental fatigue. Think about the last time you went to a gym, and if you're serious about weightlifting, you probably worked with a partner. Now, that partner is there for two reasons. The one reason is they're there to lift the very heavy weight off you if you hit physiological fatigue and you can't lift it. The other reason they're there is to offer encouragement and a little bit of intimidation because oftentimes before you hit physiological fatigue, you hit a sort of mental fatigue where you just sort of lose the gumption or the willpower to lift that weight. However, if you have somebody there that is uh, casting aspersions on your manhood or uh, your physique, uh, oftentimes you can rise above this temporary mental fatigue and do one or two extra reps in there. And so it's important to realize that some fatigue is physiological, whereas a lot of times it's also partially mental. So now that we know the different types of muscle metabolism, we're going to go talk about different types of muscle fibers or cells that are optimized to either do aerobic or anaerobic respiration. And the first one of these fibers is something called a slow oxidative fiber. A slow oxidative fiber has a slow ATPase enzyme. Remember that ACE on the end of the word means enzyme. And so an ATPase is an enzyme that breaks down ATP into ADP. And in the process, it releases that energy that myosin uses to cock back the myosin head and form that cross bridge. And so slow oxidative muscle just has a slow ATPase enzyme. Now slow oxidative muscle isn't very slowly contraction. It actually can have fairly quick contractions, but it does require a lot of oxygen and also a rich blood supply. And for this reason, you'll often see that uh, slow oxidative muscle is also very red. And the reason it's red is because it contains lots of myoglobin. And remember, myoglobin was that special protein that binds up oxygen within muscle cells. And so we tend to find myoglobin in very metabolically active muscles that use a lot of oxygen. The other thing you should know about slow oxidative fibers is that the fibers themselves tend to be fairly skinny and weak. But they do have many mitochondria, and, it, and as I said, lots of myoglobin. So the combination of having many mitochondria, a really good blood supply, tends to make us a high endurance muscle. And so slow oxidative fibers are present in mammals, but they're also present in fishes as well. And so if you've ever gone to a really nice sashimi restaurant, you see them cutting the tuna up, you'll notice the tuna is very red, and that's because it's made up of slow oxidative fibers. There's a lot of 
mitochondria in there. And the red color again is due to the high amount of myoglobin, which is binding oxygen. And think about tuna. What kind of fish are they? Well, they tend to swim very long distances. They spend their whole life swimming. You never see them resting on the bottom. And that's why their muscle mass is made up primarily of these slow oxidative fibers, which have high endurance. A second type of muscle fiber is something called a fast glycolytic fiber. Fast here refers again to the ATPase enzyme. So in comparison to the slow fibers, the fast fibers split ATP very, very quickly, giving us a readily available supply of energy. As a result, these muscles tend to be very good for short bursts of energy, but they're not very good for endurance. And that's because they have few mitochondria and also very little myoglobin. And so if you look at these fast glycolytic fibers, they tend to be less red and more white because they have less myoglobin. They also have a smaller blood supply, fewer capillaries, but in comparison to the slow oxidative fibers, their fibers are much larger and much stronger. So these are good, again, for very quick bursts of energy, and they can be very strong right off the starting line, but they tend to tire very quickly. And so if you're running a 50-yard dash or something like this, you're going to be primarily using your fast twitch fibers or fast glycolytic fibers because you're only moving a short distance, and those are the fibers that are the strongest and the fastest responding. However, if you're starting to run a longer race, let's say a marathon, which is 26 miles, pretty soon you're going to start relying more on your slow oxidative fibers because these are the ones that are going to get you through sustained muscle contraction. And so if we look at two different athletes, both of which are runners, the guy that just runs the 50-yard or 100-yard dash is going to have a majority of fast glycolytic fibers, whereas the guy that runs lots of marathons is going to have primarily slow oxidative fibers. So it's important to realize that a human body or any mammalian or even avian body contains a mixture of both slow oxidative fibers and fast glycolytic fibers. And these fibers tend to be differentially distributed throughout the muscles in the body. The more metabolically active muscles, the muscles that are used more frequently, tend to have a higher proportion of slow oxidative fibers. For example, if we look at a chicken, what does it do most of the time? Is it flying or is it walking? Well, chickens pretty much walk around most of the time, and so if we look at the muscle or meat, it tends to contain more of the slow oxidative fibers. That is, the muscle tissue itself contains more mitochondria. It also contains more blood vessels and more myoglobin, and that's why the dark meat on chickens is dark, because it contains more myoglobin. On the other hand, if we take a look at the breast muscles of a chicken, we see that it consists mainly of fast glycolytic fibers. Now these fibers don't have much in the way of myoglobin, there's not a very good blood supply, but they are very strong fibers, and so they're very good for short bursts of muscular contraction. And so a chicken can, in fact, fly, I've seen it happen a lot, but they're not going to fly any long distances. If you happen to surprise one, if you're driving really quickly uh, through a road and one jumps up in front of your car, they can fly away, but they're not going to be flying more than, let's say, 50 or 100 feet before they sit down again and that's because their muscle tissue in their breast is primarily made of fast glycolytic fibers that are strong but tire very easily. Okay, before we close out this lecture, we need to talk about the terms atrophy and hypertrophy. So atrophy is the wasting away of muscles, and it can be caused by disuse, in which case we call it disuse atrophy, or by severing of the nerve supply, called denervation atrophy. And what happens is that the muscle shrinks in diameter, and some of the muscle fibers are converted into fibrous connective tissue or even adipose tissue. And once this happens, this process cannot be reversed. Uh, the muscle fibers will not regrow. They won't uh, go through mitosis. That muscle mass has been lost, and it's been lost permanently. In order to build that muscle back up, we can do some exercise in strengthening the existing fibers, but there's no way to bring back the fibers that have been lost. And the opposite of atrophy is something called hypertrophy. Remember, the prefix hyper means greater than, and trophy means to build up. So hypertrophy of muscle is an increase in the diameter of muscle fibers and the diameter of muscles. It's important to realize that when muscles get bigger through exercise, it's not because that the cells are dividing, but that the individual cell diameter is growing. And hypertrophy of muscles results from very forceful, repetitive muscular activity, that is, working out. And in addition to resulting in larger than normal muscle cells, we also get an increase in the number of myofibrils and the amount of sarcoplasmic reticulum, and of course the amount of mitochondria. And so if you take a look at right, you can see a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime. He was a very muscular dude, 
In part, that's because he had very good genes, but it's also because he put in the requisite amount of time in the gym. And remember, that muscle growth was not due to mitosis or anything like that, but the fact that the individual muscle fibers had enlarged in response to this repetitive exercise. Now, humans aren't the only animals that can experience hypertrophy of the musculoskeletal system. Below, you can see an example of a cow and a dog, both of which have muscular hypertrophy. And so the cow has obviously been bred to have a gene that produces excessive musculature, and the dog, a whippet, normally doesn't have very much musculature at all. They're very skinny dogs, but this one has a particular genetic defect that makes it more muscular than normal, making it look like Godzilla dog. Okay, you've reached the end of the lecture on muscle physiology. As normal, there will be a few review questions at the end of this lecture. Your performance on these questions will not affect your grade, but I do suggest that if you get less than a 70% on them, you go back and review the lecture and take more detailed notes. Now, before I close out, I want to give you some links to some very good web resources having to do with muscular physiology. And so the four links below include animations of the steps necessary for muscular contraction, as well as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. Now, some of the narration isn't so hot. Some of it apparently was even done by high school students, but the animations are much better than any of the stick drawings that I've given you in lecture. So if you've got a few minutes, be sure to click on each one of these and take a look at these animations.